Gold. It is gifted as a symbol of love. It has started wars. It has governed our monetary systems. It's even used on space shuttles to reflect the sun. In the Americas, gold would go on to shape landscapes, politics, people, and history. When Christopher Columbus stumbled onto the continent, he quickly enslaved the indigenous people and ordered them to find him gold. And there have been gold rushes in the Americas. In 1799 in North Carolina, in California in 1848. But there has been one gold rush that seems to stick in our collective consciousness. The Klondike Gold Rush. It has been preserved in time, in music, film, books, radio, and beyond. Just the mention of Dawson City evokes images of can-can girls in saloons with swinging doors and prospectors with pickaxes desperately panning and weighing gold nuggets. But what do we know about Dawson before the gold rush? And what happened once it was over? This is The Secret Life of Canada, a history podcast about the country you know and the stories you don't. Okay, when you... Think of the Yukon. What do you think of? Northern Lights. Potatoes. Gold. It's very mountainous, super cold. The artist community there. When you think of Dawson City, does that make you think of anything different, or is it all sort of one thing? I think of Dawson's Creek, obviously. (laughs) That's that's honest. (laughs) Would you like to go to Dawson City? Well, yes, I would. Yeah, why? Because it's beautiful. What makes you think that? Because there's lots of snow. I don't know. Hey, Fallon. Hey, Leah. So today I want to start by showing you a video. Okay. This is going to be gross, isn't it? It depends on who you ask. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if I want to see this. You'll be fine. I I promise. Okay. I trust you. Not really, though. But I'll try and stay open. This better not come back to bite me. Okay, so this video was taken back in 2016 when I was in the Yukon touring a theater production. We traveled all over the territory, from Whitehorse to Watson Lake. But I gotta say, my favorite place was Dawson City. Okay, and that's where we're headed today? Oh, yes. It's one of the coolest places I have ever been in my life. And although I was only there for a very short amount of time, it's a place that has really stuck with me. The pristine landscapes, the brilliantly blue lakes, the mountains, the northern lights, and the really amazing people I met there. Honestly, they are so generous and lovely. I dream of getting back there as soon as possible. You know, I've never seen you so excited to talk about a place, actually, or maybe about anything. (laughs) I I honestly don't really know much about Dawson other than it was where a lot of old-timey prospectors went in search for gold. You know, it's got all that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And that did happen. And we will talk about that. But it really is a small part of the history of the place. Cool. I'm expecting a lot of gunfights and feather boas. So take me there. Again, small part. Don't expect too much of that. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. As I headed into Dawson, I knew there was one thing I had to do. Oh, no. Is this a flashback to our bear episode from season one? God, no. No. Bear and lady love. (laughs) Oh, my God. That's a theme. There's just got a theme now. (laughs) Okay. No, it is not about bear lady love. Uh, Let me just show you the video, okay? Okay. I feel like it's going to scar me so bad. It might. Without further ado. Okay. So it's a bar, a saloon, if you will. Yes, that's the Sourdough Saloon in Dawson. Okay, there you are sitting, you're you're sitting down, another person sitting across from you, and on the table is some sort of shot, I'm assuming alcohol, obviously. Yeah, you're correct with that. And and what's what's that there, Leah? It's a plate of something that looks like, honestly, like a cat turd. (laughs) That, Leah... Is a toe. Oh, no, I have heard about this. Why does it look like that, though? Well, to preserve it, to preserve the toe, they put it in salt so it dehydrates it. So it's... It's a human toe. Okay, the bartender's talking to you. Now she's dropping the toe into a shot, and you are picking it up, and no! (laughs) (laughs) I'm so wrong. Okay, Leah, so what you just saw there is called the Sour Toe Shot, and it dates back to the 1920s. Why is this a thing Okay, so that people do? I know, I know. Oh, my God. <laughs> the story goes, back in the 1920s, these two brothers who were liquor smugglers, Louis and Otto Lincoln, one of them, uh, on one of their runs between Alaska and the Yukon, the brothers got hit with some bad weather, and Louis got a soaker. 
Oh, yeah, I know what that is, a wet foot. Yes, a very wet foot. And so Louis got a wet foot, but instead of drying it off, they kept going because they thought the police were on their trail. But uh, due to prolonged exposure, Louis's toe froze solid. To prevent gangrene, Louis's brother cut the toe off with a wood axe and used some overproof rum to ease Louis's Ooh, pain. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that would sort of help, I guess. <laughs> so, and as some odd commemoration of the event, they saved the toe in rum. Wow, what a, what a family. I know, right? <laughs> would one of your siblings cut off one no. of your toes for well, you? maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe not for me. <laughs> for, them, for themselves. For themselves. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So in 1973, while cleaning out an abandoned cabin, the toe was discovered by Captain Dick Stevenson, a local man who ran a riverboat for tourists. After he conferred with some of his friends over some drinks, the Sour Toe Cocktail Club was established. And the rules, uh, they were simple. You can drink it fast, you can drink it slow, but your lips must touch that gnarly toe. <laughs> and <laughs> I can't believe I know. this. <laughs> <laughs> and there are said to be uh, upward of 60,000 members of the Sour Toe Club. And so does this gross club of <laughs> sour toe people, is there an official drink? To... <laughs> well, they only have one drink, really, and, and oh. the, the recipe for it is one ounce of alcohol, one dehydrated human toe, and you garnish it with courage. And so, wait, is it the same toe that they've had since 1970? It's just one toe? No, or... no, no. It's, it's a different toe. The toe has actually been stolen, lost, and even... Ingested. Oh, why did I ask? I know. I hope no one is eating while listening to this episode. I'm, dear Canada, I'm very sorry we've ruined your breakfast, lunch, dinner, slash life with this episode. <laughs> apologies, deepest apologies. Okay, so where are all these toes coming from? Well, people donate their toes that have had them removed for various medical reasons, um, like frostbite. My toe came from a woman who ran her foot over with a <laughs> lawnmower, apparently. <laughs> I didn't. I'm sorry. I need to just back up because I actually didn't realize the toes were real. I thought they were like a simulation of a toe made out of, you know, froyo or whatever. Froyo. <laughs> Jesus. I just I'm. Don't I, be disgusted. I, I'm kind of in shock that people. Well, I have so many questions. Like, when your toe gets cut off with a lawnmower, mm -hmm. why is the first thought not? Let me just run to the emergency room and get it sewed on. Why is your first thought, I'm going to, you know, wrap it up and send it to Dawson to put in there? Well, I think you probably go to the hospital and then they're like, you're, the toe's got to go. <laughs> or you like pick it up off the ground. Oh, my gosh. I feel ill. OK. Hey, I am highly susceptible to peer pressure. And many people have done the toe shot. Apparently, even Pierre Elliott Trudeau and the prolific Canadian writer Pierre Burton, who was born in Whitehorse and lived in Dawson, have done the sour toe shot. But Phelan, if all the famous Canadian Pierres jump off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge too? I might. <laughs> but you do make <laughs> yeah, a good okay, point. That's fair. Actually, in, in 2013, uh, this guy named Joshua Clark, an American who was working in the Yukon, went one step too far with the toe. In a misguided attempt to show his commitment to the territory, he swallowed the toe on purpose. So he did this as a prank then? Yeah, I guess it was like some way to like show his commitment and love to Dawson. Flowers are overrated. Cannibalism. Now that is love. Yeah, yeah. So at the time, Joshua swallowed the toe. The fine the bar had put in place was $500. And actually, when Joshua swallowed the toe, he took out $500 and slammed it down on the table. Like he was prepared. He was ready for it. He was it. ready to do it. Okay. He was, it was intentional. So they had never had anyone swallow the toe on purpose. And so after that, they increased the fine to $2,500. Oh my gosh, that is a lot for a weird joke. It is. It really is. Uh, for me, taking the sour toe shot was kind of a way of getting closer to Dawson. It was like one one step to gaining my sourdough status. What is sourdough status? Like the bread? Okay. Kind of. Sourdough status is sort of an affectionate nickname for a person who spends a significant amount of time in the Yukon. Some say if you are in the Yukon from freeze up of the river to break up of the river, then you get sourdough status. But 
Why sourdough? Are, do you mean sour toe? No, no, sourdough. Okay. Like the bread. It's kind of interesting because, I don't know, maybe just to me because I really like bread and mm-hmm. probably to Katie, our producer, because she loves sourdough more than just about that anyone I've true. ever met. She talks about sourdough like a lot. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> And now I'm going to turn it over to Katie for Sourdough Corner. <laughs> sourdough Minute with Katie Jensen. <laughs> Can I leave it a minute? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so during the gold rush in San Francisco in the mid 1800s, which was in many ways the precursor to the gold rush in the Klondike Dawson region, there was a family that had come from France, the Boudin family. They came to the Americas to seek their fortune, and with them, they brought their bread recipe for sourdough. The bread has a unique taste, and it was really embraced by the prospectors in San Francisco at the time. And so as they were rushing from one gold rush to the next, they brought the bread with them. It's interesting, but it's still really weird. It is. It is kind of weird. But sourdough is a fairly simple dough. All you need is a starter, a piece of pre-existing sourdough, uh, flour, and water. And because winters are hard in the north, if you had a starter and some flour, you could pretty much make bread and that would really help to sustain you over a winter. Okay, well, bread is great and everything, obviously, but can we move on to some history in Dawson or of yes, Dawson? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Okay. okay, we are now done with Sourdough Corner. Excellent. All right, so Dawson City now is situated at the convergence of the Yukon and Klondike River. Before Dawson City was Dawson City, it was situated in the area of an ancient fishing village called Tronchek Gwich'in. People came there for hundreds of years to this place to catch salmon, dry fish, and to live. The Trondek Gwich'in are frequently referred to as the Han, so we're going to switch between those two terms today. So the name Trondek Gwich'in comes from a few words in the Han language, uh, and it translates to the people who live at the mouth of the Klondike. The people were so deeply connected to the piece of land that they are they are tied to it by name. So the Trondek Gwich'in were settled all over the area around what we now know as Dawson City. And they moved through the area from camp to camp depending on the time of year. Each place was important to the way of life of the Trondek Gwich'in. And they were masters of their surroundings. They built lightweight birch bark canoes, uh, moose hide canoes, fishing nets and weirs. Wait, 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 what's a weir? A way to catch fish in the water. So they, they put these poles in the water and then they sort of have nets that connect between the two poles. And so when mm-hmm. fish swim from downstream... Oh, they'll cool. get caught, and so they can catch a lot all at once. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, they're pretty common, like, all over. all over. Okay. Um, so even though they were living in this sometimes harsh climate, they really lived successfully and sustainably off the land and the waterways. Uh, there was plentiful foods like blueberries, cranberries, moss berries, currants, rose hips, uh, and really great sources of protein like moose and salmon. They were so plentiful. And at what point did settlers come into the picture? Or this is way before that. Not just yet. So even before the arrival of the treasure hunters, uh, the influence of non-Indigenous people was being felt in the area. The Han had always traded with other nations, but now these neighbors, such as the Gwich'in in the north and the Tanana in the south, had begun trading with non-Indigenous people for goods like kettles, woolen blankets, beads, and guns. Non-Indigenous traders were looking for furs, and that pushed the Han more towards a trading economy. Right. And during the time of the gold rush, the border between what was then the Northwest Territories and Alaska was still largely undefined. Is that right? Yeah, totally right. Canada was still a very young country. In fact, Russia controlled much of what is now Alaska until 1867, when it was purchased by the U.S. Secretary of State, William Seward. It was actually dubbed Seward's Folly because everyone thought it was a wasteland. Incredibly, they purchased this wasteland for $7 million, which would be $125 million today. And the reason why the Russians sold was basically to build a relationship with the U.S. They wanted to get closer to the U.S. And they also wanted to get close to Canada to annoy the British. Okay. So we have a lot of outsiders starting to encroach on the Han territory. Yes. But the Han and the settlers weren't meeting directly just yet. First contact started around 1874 when trading posts at Fort Reliance were established by traders 
and prospectors. Uh, they were working on commission for the Alaska Commercial Company. So what is the Alaska Commercial Company? Is that kind of, they were like the Hudson's Bay? Yeah, exactly. It was a similar style company. It acted as a post office, the courthouse, and most importantly, a trading post. People from across nations would come to trade with settlers. And in fact, this post at Fort Reliance became so important to the area that other locations up and down river were named for their estimated proximity to the fort, places like 40 Mile and 12 Mile. Uh, Can you imagine that every small town or surrounding area, you know, of Edmonton or, you know, of Saskatoon just gets named two miles away from Saskatoon or like 10 miles. That's essentially what they were doing, right? Yeah. So were indigenous people trading gold at this time with each other? No, no. They knew about the gold in the area, but they didn't place any value on it. One of the children of Trondek, uh, Lucy Wood, she recalled that growing up, one of her favorite pastimes, this would have been pre-gold rush, was collecting soft yellow rocks and keeping them in a moose hide sack. They were trinkets of no real value, as the metal was too soft to make any tools or anything out of use, really. It would be these soft, yellow, useless rocks that would eventually force the Han people out of Trondek Wetchen. Mm. So ironic. And so this is when the gold rush started then? In a way, yes. In the 1870s, prospector George Carmack came north from California. He married a woman from the Tagish Nation. Uh, When she died, George coupled with her sister, who he renamed Kate. George's fellow white prospectors then gave him the nickname Squaw Man. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, I know he's got a lot of bad names, that's that one. That's bad. Yeah. So in the summer of 1886, George Carmack, his now common-law wife Kate, Kate's brother, Skookum Jim, and her nephew Dawson Charlie were traveling the Klondike River prospecting, hunting, and fishing. Okay, so this whole family affair, we have George, who was white, who was traveling with Kate, Jim, and Charlie, who were indigenous. Yes, from the Tagish Nation specifically. The group was on a tributary of the Klondike River, Rabbit Creek, when they found gold. Now, the story of how the gold was found has been disputed. There are accounts that Skookum Jim was cleaning up after shooting a moose when he saw gold in the creek. Oh, so they weren't even looking for it when they found it. Well, the story does sort of vary, but George was the person who staked the official claim. But when you think about the time, you can imagine why they might trust a white guy to make the claim on their behalf, um, you know, so that it would be taken seriously and validated. George would go on to say that he was the sole discoverer of the gold. Ah, old white guys discovering things that were already there. Classic. I know, that's a really reoccurring theme. Mm -hmm. George had actually been given the nickname Lying George because of his tendency to stretch the truth. (laughs) So it does make you wonder. He has terrible nicknames. I know, right? So many terrible nicknames. So George staked the claim with the following handwritten sign. To whom it may concern... I do this day locate and claim by right of discovery 500 feet, running upstream from this notice, located the 17th day of August, 1896. G.W. Carmack. But the fact was the group was far from any town that would be able to process the gold. And so although they had some, they needed to wait until after the winter to sluice or clean the gold. That winter, Kate kept the family fed by doing laundry for other miners in the area. Damn, I can't imagine what miner laundry must smell like. Ugh. Remember, there was no Febreze at this time, so she was just doing the laundry by hand with soap. I hope she made a ton of money. She didn't. Of course. (laughs) Yeah, she didn't. So eventually what would happen is that Kate and George would move south into the States and their marriage would grow unhappy. Okay. George actually remarried in 1900 and Kate contested the marriage, but because she didn't have any legal marriage papers, of course, she didn't have a leg to stand on legally. Right. So... She didn't get any of the $1.5 million she was entitled to for helping to discover the gold. That's brutal and tragic. Yeah. George left it all to his new wife, and Kate died at the age of 62 in 1920 near Car Cross in the Yukon in a cabin that Skookum Jim built for her. Hmm. So that's how Kate's story ends. But it wasn't until almost a year and a half after their initial discovery that word spread to the south about the gold. And that is when the gold rush really sparked. By this time, local miners had already gotten the jump and flocked to the area around Rabbit Creek, or, as it was now being called, Bonanza Creek. 
Uh, yes. So this is when a lot of people started showing up really quickly then. Yes. Okay. When news broke in July 1897 that a steamship arrived in Seattle with more than a ton of gold, the stampede to the north was on. Mm-hmm. But to get to the Klondike area was not an easy feat. The fastest route was to take a boat from Seattle to Skagway, a port town in southern Alaska, and then they would have to travel up and over the Chilkoot Pass on foot. And that's if they made it across the pass. If. Oh, yeah. Going over the pass was grueling, and many didn't make it. Law required that stampeders, the stampeders being the name given to the mass of prospectors coming into the area, had to take along appropriate supplies, and these supplies weighed 2,000 pounds per person. How is that even possible to carry, or, I mean, how did they do it? Well, some wealthy gold seekers would hire local indigenous people because they knew the pass and could navigate it, but others who weren't so well off had to do it themselves. And they would have to do it in many trips. Some died, some got caught in avalanches, or simply turned back. Thousands of stampeders would attempt to make the journey to the Klondike in 1897, with 7,000 turning back. I would definitely have been one of the 7,000. Actually, I wouldn't have even been in the 7,000 because I wouldn't have gone in the first place. No, I just would have read the stories. Yeah, I would have been like, oh. Yeah, ditto. If you could make it over the mountain pass, the trip got much easier. Then you would build a boat and you would ride it down the Yukon River to Dawson. That still sounds really hard. It does sound really hard to build a boat. I just made boat building sound easy. Just build build a a boat. boat, (laughs) Bring your wood across the pass with (laughs) your nails and all the equipment. Like, anyway, yeah. I think think they repurposed things. Like, the things that they carried over, they repurposed them into boat materials. Right. Lots of people did do this, though. And lots of famous people. Novelist Jack London, who wrote books like White Fang and Call of the Wild, Alexander Pantages, who would go on to open a string of successful theaters in Canada and the U.S., so many famous sports figures, entertainers, and this is one of my favorite things I learned in my research. One, Frederick Trump. Right. I remember this was in the news recently, and I'm so sad it was because that means we have to talk about the Trumps. So Donald Trump's grandfather was Frederick Trump. I think his father was also named Frederick Trump. But anyway, Frederick Trump has some connection to the Yukon. I think he owned a restaurant or... Yes, yes, he did. Um, Frederick made it over the mountain pass and he set up a tent restaurant that is reported to have served flash frozen horse meat, which unfortunately was plentiful at the time. Mm, Because? Well, crossing over the pass wasn't just hard on people. A lot of animals didn't make it. It was even nicknamed Dead Horse Trail. Oh, well, I mean, that's not a big surprise. You can kind of imagine. That's what I imagine, just people bringing all these animals over and them not making it. So Frederick Trump, though, what's his deal? So Frederick Trump, he saw an opportunity with all this horse meat lying about. He set up a restaurant near the town of Bennett and eventually made his way to Whitehorse. His restaurant was called the New Arctic Restaurant and Hotel. But it wasn't just a restaurant slash hotel. It also boasted rooms for ladies, which was code at the time for brothel. Mm -hmm. So this is how the hotel magnet family became a hotel magnet family. It's really interesting that it all started as a brothel. And to be fair, this wasn't uncommon at the time and certainly wasn't the first or last brothel in the Yukon. Of course. I think the only reason that it's fascinating or interesting now is because the dynasty that this family has that ties to hotel and to scandal. Yeah, right, right. Interesting. It's interesting to think about that legacy. And in some ways, it was kind of smart what Frederick was doing. He was mining the miners and it was a profitable business. The chances of finding gold weren't great, but the chances of people needing what his establishment could provide was a sure thing. Mm -hmm. The gold rush brought tens of thousands of people between the years of 1896 and 1899. And just for a little context, the population of the whole of the Yukon Territory now is about 36,000 people. Okay, gotcha. So this was a very intense time. Yes, lots of people coming in. And some predicted the influx of people and saw opportunity beyond panning for gold, including Joseph Ledoux, a prospector who, after the discovery of gold at Rabbit Creek slash Bonanza Creek, purchased 160 acres across from the Klondike River as a town site and called it Dawson City after George M. Dawson, a geologist who had recently surveyed the area. Okay, so this was the beginning of Dawson City. This was the beginning. 
Ledoux set up a mill and a saloon and began to sell lots for $300 a piece. $300 seems expensive for the time. Oh, yeah, it, it was, which is why some people moved across the river to Tronchek Gwich'in, the Han fishing village. The settlement then started to be called Lewistown. More renaming. Yeah. Lewistown is a terrible name. And this is when the indigenous people began to be pushed around and out of their territory. There was a huge land grab. You had prospectors, businessmen, and colonial structures like the church and mounties all fighting for foothold. At this time, the Han were being met with a bunch of foreign ideas and concepts. Sure, they had never placed any value on gold, but these newcomers were head over heels for it. Right. So this would change their relationship with the gold. Exactly. Some settlers began paying indigenous people for their land and lodgings with gold, but sometimes with fake gold rocks painted yellow. Mm. I'm not surprised by this, actually. No, me neither. So the concept of land ownership was really a Western idea, a colonial idea. So when the Han were accepting gold for portions of land, it wasn't understood that payment was for the land, for the resources, and for permanent ownership. Right. So this is more of that murky history where if it's not on paper, it seems like there's no proof, but then there's an indigenous oral tradition and it's... Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. Right. All of those things. Mm -hmm. So there was a major culture clash going on. Saloons and brothels were popping up and all this development pushed the Han from settlement to settlement, mm -hmm. even at one point ending up next to the Northwest Mounted Police headquarters. Oh, I can't imagine that would go well. It didn't. Inspector Charles C. Constantine, who was stationed in the area, had this to say about the indigenous people. The whites are the providers and workers in this country and should enjoy all privileges. The instructions concerning Indian affairs given me when I came to this country were that the Indians were not to be recognized in any way which would lead them to believe the government would do anything for them as Indians. I presume these orders are still in force, and I consider that they should remain in force as the Indians are well able to maintain themselves without any government assistance, whatever. This was a time of extreme change, not just for those indigenous to the land, but to the land itself. Lumber was needed for new lodgings, for the influx of miners, so many of the trees were cut down, which drove away much of the game in the area. By fall 1897, the year that five tons of gold were extracted from Dawson, the nearby fishing village, Tronchek Hogwachin, had been obliterated. The ancient fishing weirs were destroyed by mining rafts going up and down the river. Within a year, life as the Han knew it had rapidly started to disappear. The chief at the time, Chief Isaac, witnessed these changes happening in his territory and realized something needed to be done. In the spring of 1897, Chief Isaac made the difficult decision to move his people five kilometers downriver to a new settlement, Moosehide. Chief Isaac was so important and respected. He is thought of as a great bridge builder between his community and the settlers coming in. He maintained traditional ways while still being able to be friendly with the church. He was the leader of his people at such a critical time, and he handled it as best anyone could. Wow. It sounds like he was really trying to just make sure that all of these changes that were happening in his community could be lived through in a way. Yeah, it was like uh, as gentle as it could possibly be. Mm -hmm. But even though life had changed for the Trondek Gwich'in, they adapted. They made clothing and worked alongside some farmers in the area. Some worked on local boats. Two women made the news when they bought a sewing machine in order to make moccasins easier. Chief Isaac would speak with local newspapers as a way to help communicate with the newcomers, to try and get the perspective of his people out and known. He even invited them to Christmas at Moosehide one year, as long as the visitors promised to be well-behaved. That's really generous. It's really nice, yeah. He was described by the Alaska Weekly in 1932 as... Tall, slender, sinewy, and muscular, he was of superior physical proportions, and time also proved him as well endowed mentally. His friendliness to the whites, dating back to the days of the Russian occupation of the Yukon in Alaska, and his influence with other Indians, went for towards smoothing the way for prospectors, traders, trappers, missionaries, and others who pioneered the Northland. 
those who knew Chief Isaac well agreed that had he been a white man with opportunities for education, combined with his natural ability and personality, he would have proved to be an extraordinary figure in most any walk of life. Some of the Han say that Chief Isaac knew that his people's traditions and customs were being threatened, and that in order to save the community's songs and dances, he sent a record of them to the Tanana Nation in Alaska for safekeeping. It seems like he had incredible foresight. He really did. The gold rush really only lasted three years. In the winter of 1899, word that gold had been struck in Nome, Alaska broke, and many people picked up and left Dawson. The population of the town had dropped from 40,000 the previous year to just 8,000 in 1899. But the damage of those three years was still impacting the original people and would continue to do so. Disease and epidemics swept through the community. Chickenpox, tonsillitis, diphtheria, measles, tuberculosis, and influenza all affected the Han people. By the 1940s, more people died than were born in the community. It was also a common fact for a mother to have more children buried in the graveyard than in the schoolhouse. It's so terrible. I know. But again, these people, the Trondek Gwetchen, survived. And in the 1940s and 50s, as the settler population in Dawson City continued to decline, the Han people began moving back to their traditional territory. They began to move home. But home had changed. And the adjustment was difficult for some. In 1973, the Yukon First Nations gave Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau a document, Together Today for Our Children Tomorrow, a statement of grievances and an approach to settlement by the Yukon Indian people. This was the beginning of the Land Settlement Agreement. This was a time of reclamation of knowledge and culture. It would take until 1997 for the site of Trondek Gwetchen to be recognized and protected as a part of the Han people's land claim. And in many ways, reclamation is still going on and will continue. Because places like Trondek Gwetchen are worth fighting for. All you have to do is step on that land once and you'll know why. The Secret Life of Canada is recorded in Toronto on the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee, Wendat, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the New Credit. It's written and hosted by me, Phelan Johnson. And me, Leah Simone Bowen. And produced by Katie Jensen. Our historical consultant is John Weir. And our digital producer is Fabiola Carletti. The senior producer of CBC Podcasts is Tanya Springer. And the executive producer is Arif Narani. We're on Instagram and Twitter at Secret Life of CAD. If there's a story you want to hear in an episode or a piece of history you want to tell us about, email us at secretlifeofcanada at cbc.ca. If you like what you heard, or even if you didn't, please review us on iTunes. It really helps other people find us. Check out Escaping Nexium, taking you inside the bizarre self-help group that attracted actors, politicians, and the super wealthy, and is now the center of an FBI investigation. Escaping Nexium, one woman's journey to take down the secret of personal growth organization from CBC Podcast's new investigative series, Uncover. Catch us next time when we explore Toronto's history in our first ever live episode. That's right. We know Toronto's not the center of the universe, but we still did a live show on it, our very first live show. And so, literally it's yeah. about Toronto being the center of the universe, yeah, so, so stay tuned for that. Yeah, you're going to love it. Thanks for exploring Canada's hidden history with us, and remember to pass it on.